We have a couple of special events coming up soon we want you to be aware of regarding eating disorders. And Emily Carruthers from the Center for Discovery Mental Park is with us, along with Kira Olson, the Program Manager for Eating Disorders Resource Center. Nice to have you both here. Thanks. Hi, it's good thank to be you. here. It's been a while, so I'm glad you're back, you know, and I know you have a lot you want to talk about. Just give us an overview of some of the events coming up soon. We're really excited to take part in National Eating Disorder Awareness Week. It's something that happens every year, last week in February, typically. And uh, this year we have several events going on, including our um, Everybody's Beautiful Annual Essay Contest. It's our fifth annual year for that, and we'll go into more detail. Who participates in an essay contest like that? So the essay contest is for all uh, local, so Santa Clara County, 6th through 12th graders. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do we get involved in that if we want to do that, you 6th through 12th graders who got up early to hear us? Basically, it's an opportunity for them to write about what's beautiful to them and why. So in 500 words or less, they can write about what they love about themselves, um, what how the media has affected their body image and view of self, and they just submit it via beauty at edrcs org. Okay. They can also call us for questions. And our number is 408-356-1212. Repeat that for those of us who think slowly. 408-356-1212. You probably heard about the, the girl who petitioned Disney to come up with the chubby princess yep. so that everybody can relate. I think that was a wonderful idea. And everybody sort of embraced that, even Disney, as I recall. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I imagine you embraced it, too. We did. Yeah. We definitely did. So what is the deal with eating disorders so that we can all relate? All right. I'm going to jump in here and say, when I get depressed, I want to eat. Mm-hmm. You know, when mm-hmm. I'm unhappy with things, I am very aware of the fact that I want a candy bar or mm-hmm. a pint of ice cream. You know, and so is that an eating disorder or is it something milder than that? And are there levels of eating disorders that we need to be concerned with? Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, you know, what you're talking about, well, is just emotional eating. Um, but there are subclinical eating disorders, which can definitely be really dangerous. Um, but there are very specific criteria that outline the different eating disorder diagnoses. With the new DSM-5 that just came out, um, included in that now is binge eating disorder. So the typical diagnoses that um, people are probably familiar with are anorexia nervosa, mm-hmm. bulimia nervosa, and now binge eating mm-hmm. disorder is also in there. So my pint of ice cream falls into the binge eating category? Not necessarily, no. If okay. there is a longstanding pattern of that associated with, with other concerns, um, extreme focus on body image, compensatory behaviors, so eating a large amount of food in a discrete period of time, coupled with some sort of behavior, either restricting or exercising or purging or using a substance um, to, to then lose the weight mm-hmm. um, or burn off those calories. Or lose the food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And the difference really tends to be the preoccupation of thought and how it, uh, it takes over someone's life versus just the overeating, I think, or uh, emotional overeating. We all tend to have um, you know, a tendency to moralize food, good food, bad food. And um, it, it's become very cultural to, you know, see dessert as a reward and um, and to celebrate with a pint of ice cream or, mm-hmm. you know, mourn with a pint of ice cream. But that's very different than having it take over one's life. Yeah, my approach is more primalist food, good. You know, not good food, bad food, but yeah. food good. And uh, I bring it up because not everybody knows somebody with an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. And yet it can be lurking, can't it? Yes, and probably more than you think. I think everybody out there within a certain degree of of separation probably knows somebody um, that has struggled with an eating disorder. And unfortunately, a lot of people are still not open about it. Um, It's one of the reasons why I'm involved in the Mm -hmm. EDRS, um, EDRC. And um, there's a lot of advocacy that still needs to happen. People need to know that there's help. They need to know when to get help. Eating disorders are a really, really serious issue and a very serious illness that have really potentially lethal medical consequences to them. Mm -hmm. Is that where the essay contest comes in? 
Getting the word out? Yeah, the essay contest is more of an awareness piece. So it's it's really a, a chance to get the word ab- out about who we are and then also to get people thinking critically about the media and how it might affect that. Media is not to blame at all, um, but they, they could be a component um, in it as well as just – you know, social influences and environmental influences. Well, for example, here in my job, I'm exposed to people who advocate loudly. Uh, anti-bullying, huh. it gets better. Uh, fighting against people who discriminate against gay people, various mm-hmm. things like that, you know. And those have very high pro- profiles the last few years. Mm-hmm. Are you trying to raise the profile? Is yeah. that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We part of what EDRC does is we go out and educate healthcare professionals and schools and community members on the signs and symptoms of eating disorders, different treatment methods, as well as local resources. So that's one of our big um, things that we do in the area, as well as offer free support groups for people suffering. And then, as Emily said, we do um, the advocacy component. So we've written letters to congressmen, um, attended coffee mornings with Jim Bell. Um, all of those things to to really start breaking some of the stigma and shame around eating disorders, and to raise awareness, I imagine, so people exactly. are people can attach the thoughts to it. Oh, that's what they meant. Yep. Because so often you mentioned, you know, uh, becoming aware of eating disorders uh, in every school. I imagine there are those with their secrets. You have been a volunteer for many years with EDRC. You have been involved for many years. Mm-hmm. How do you bring out those secrets? Mm-hmm. How do you get someone to expose those secrets? Going out into the schools, um, giving people an arena to to talk about it. A Oftentimes, safe place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just going into the schools, n- educating them about what an eating disorder is. I, I can't tell you how many times people will come up afterwards and you know seek me out to say I'm struggling. What do I do? Where do I go? It's one of the things that EDRC is great for. Is it's a clearinghouse and really a, a resource for getting people connected with appropriate services. Um, they can attend a support group and get some more information and determine you know what kind of treatment they're going to need. Um, mm-hmm. But just having having people talk about it and eliminate shame and know that there's a place to go. And just uh, really connecting with people and asking them questions to get them thinking about what their thought process is, what their eating behaviors are, and um, or their, their friends so that it might trigger something in them that's, you know, um, like, oh, I have someone that struggles with this or, oh, that sounds familiar to me. And mm-hmm. then people start reaching out. It's like what people say about what's fundamental with dealing with an addiction is you got to want to. Mm-hmm. You have to be in a place in your heart, in your head, that you are ready to ask for help and accept it. And that must be the hardest part because this is so much more difficult to detect and perhaps uh, the symptoms aren't as strong as, say, somebody hitting bottom with alcoholism mm-hmm. or drugs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something that within the therapy world we call um, ego syntonic, meaning that people tend to feel good about the outcome of their eating disorder. And originally it starts as an effort to control their, their body, their weight, and their shape. Mm-hmm. And they get a lot of really positive feedback about it initially. So why would somebody want to change that behavior when initially they're seeing really positive outcome from it? Then it starts to take on a life of its own, and there are physical symptoms and the medical issues that go along with that that just make it spiral out of control. So they're reacting to positive feedback they got once upon a time even, perhaps, you know, and I've told this story before, but I met Karen Carpenter once, and mm-hmm. it was towards the end of her life. And it was at a function. She and Richard were there, uh, judges at a musical competition. And my thought was, oh, my God, this poor woman can't last long. And her brother was next to her, and we were all around her. And you couldn't escape the thought, and yet she did. She escaped that thought to her demise. So when you're inside that person, when you have that problem, you can't see it, can you? No. There's significant distortion, and actually with malnourishment, that feeds into the cycle of distortion. Um, it, it affects the brain chemistry, and so it, um, it causes not only anxiety and depression, and, um, but, but triggers the whole cycle of you know, not eating or if it's binge eating. There's similar distortion with binge eating as well and, and bulimia. I don't know where to begin with regards to trying to ferret it out, and that's Mm -hmm. your job every single day. I guess we begin with 
several events that you got coming up, mm-hmm. including one on the 20th. Yep, on the 20th. Um, so Stanford is actually taking part in National Eating Disorder Awareness Week, and they are putting on a, in a free event actually called Life After an Eating Disorder. So it's all about what it's like after an eating disorder, the process of recovery, um, some of the struggles that people might experience in recovery, um, and then hope as well for people that are struggling. And that's from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at Lucille Packard. And again, it is free. It's going to be instructed by Allison Darcy, who works with Stanford. And it's limited space for that one. So um, RSVPs are needed to Lucille Packard directly. So the number to call for that is 650-724-4601. So if you're timid about it and you, you know, maybe a little embarrassed, you know, can you go and quietly observe and kind of get an idea of where you might fit in? Absolutely, completely. But um, RSVPs are, uh, are required for that in order to have okay. a spot. And what about the self-love diet, the only diet that works? This is happening on the 25th? On the 25th, um, from 4 to 5.30 p.m., actually Center for Discovery, so where Emily works, is sponsoring um, this event for us. And it's called the Self-Love Diet, the only diet that works. Uh, we're bringing Michelle Monero out to San Jose, and she is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She also wrote the book, The Self-Love Diet. And um, she does a lot of advocacy for body healing, and um, how to accept and love yourself. And so the workshop will all will be all about the seven paths of the self-love diet. Um, and you'll leave with daily action strategies to bring love and healing to your body, relationship, and world. So that's at Martin Luther King Jr. Library. And for more information, you can go to our uh, website, and that's www.edrcsv.org. Stands for Eating Disorder Resource Center, Silicon Valley. Okay, www.edrcsv.org. We've got that for you. And the Everybody's Beautiful contest, you can also get involved through that website? Absolutely. Your day-to-day work, how many people are you involved with? How many people show up at groups? And uh, I assume you wish there were more. That's kind of a a double question. Uh, You know, on one hand, we wish that we didn't exist, you know. But I think, unfortunately, we always will. Um, There are going to be eating disorders, I'm sure, for quite some time. But um, in groups, we do have eight or nine local support groups, Mountain View, San Jose. Emily has one in Palo Alto. We just started one in Morgan Hill. And we have groups for both those suffering as well as for their family members and friends so that they get the support they need. And roughly anywhere from four to 10 to 12 people show up at those, both male and female, all different ages. Is that also the sort of an event where you can metaphorically stick your toe in, you know, and test the water and not feel too intimidated? It's the perfect place, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, oftentimes I'll get um, calls from friends or family members who are concerned and I'll invite them to come to the group and just listen and see if it sounds familiar and let them ask questions and get some strategies for helping their loved one. Are you hopeful? You've been a volunteer for many years now and now you're program manager. What about your process as a volunteer working your way through the organization? How has that evolved and how do you see the evolution of someone seeking help? That's been a really exciting process to, to be a part of and to be able to pick up the phone. We have a helpline and guide people towards the resources they need for support and recovery. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of success stories where we've been able to help people write letters to their insurance to get covered for more care or getting people to support groups or getting people into treatment um, and helping them find a program that's right for them. Um, And we have worked closely with Center for Discovery with that um, as well. So um, it's been it's been definitely transformative for me in learning how to better help people, learning more about eating disorders, learning how to better lead support groups um, and, and sometimes really listening and, and providing hope is the best thing I can offer them. Now, you two are working hand-in-hand on uh, this event, the Self-Love of Diet. How often do you work hand-in-hand and in what way? 
I work both with the EDRC as a volunteer. Um, you know, I have a private practice um, and have gotten involved in the organization um, as of several years ago. Now, additionally, I'm also the program director of Center for Discovery Menlo Park, mm -hmm. which is a residential eating disorder treatment facility for adolescents. Um, and we are sponsoring the the Michelle Monero event. So we get the opportunity to, to work together quite often, bringing different events and helping to get the word out, do some advocacy work, and really make sure that people know there are places to go and have resources available to them. And as a small nonprofit that we are, we really rely on and um, greatly appreciate the treatment centers and the you know other for-profit organizations, corporations, foundations that work with us. And a lot of our speakers come from the treatment centers or from Stanford that we send out to do our educational presentations. So we're the resource and they're the, the feet, the hands and feet. How do the young people who want to get involved in the Everybody's Beautiful Essay Contest get involved? What we typically do is we go out and either visit schools or we put flyers up. We've also called the schools. Often they hear about us through um, searches online or through our website and they'll call us to find out more information. So typically the teachers or um, superintendents, the people in charge of the school will get everyone on board, often for extra credit, which is an extra perk. And then they can reach out to us with any questions. But their school doesn't have to be involved. Anyone can participate and we will do an award presentation at the end for the, the winners. So how do we call your helpline? Our helpline, again, is 408-356-1212. So that's 408-356-1212. And again, the uh, website is www.edrcsv.org. Kira, Emily, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks. South Bay Sunday. We'll be right back.